Welcome to another exciting edition of What Is He Talking About? I'm your host, Kenny Jameson. Today, we'll be exploring the history of cryptography and encryption. In addition, we'll be discussing the connection between cryptography and education. Though we are looking at cryptography through a historical lens, this exciting topic continues to have an impact on our lives today. Most encryption that we encounter today, however, takes place behind the scenes in a digital environment. At this stage, some people may be asking, what is cryptography? Well, it's the process of making a message unintelligible to anyone but the sender and receiver of that message using a specific procedure. This process, known as encryption, is used as a way to protect messages from being read by unwanted parties. The actual word cryptography comes from a combination of Greek terms that means hidden writing. Though it might be gaining more popularity and attention in recent years with the advancement of digital technologies and the need to ensure privacy online, cryptography has actually been around since the time humans started living in small civilizations and recording messages in writing. As soon as one group of humans determined that they needed to communicate messages securely in order to protect their own interests, cryptography was born. So, how does it work? In order to give us a detailed explanation on how cryptography actually works, we have crypto expert Edwin Nigma here with us today. Welcome, Edwin. Thanks for joining us. Let's get right into it. Can you explain the basics of how encoding messages actually works? Thanks for having me. And good opening question. For any encoded message to successfully be communicated, it has to have two important parts, the cipher and the key. The cipher is the rules that are used to actually encode the message that you are sending. For example, in your title, the rule we used was to exchange one letter for a different one in the alphabet. The key is then used to explain how the rules are to be used. Again, in your title, we used a basic substitution cipher and a key of one. I get it. So that was how we got the word what to become X-I-B-U. Correct. And in order to reuse a cipher, multiple different keys are used so that each time a message is received, the way that it is decoded is slightly different. If we had used the key of three, meaning we shift each letter in the word what by three letters, it would become Z-K-D-W. That makes a lot of sense. So, are all ciphers basically created by substituting one letter for another one? Well, not exactly. Written codes typically employ one of two methods for creating the cipher. The first and simpler form is to use a monoalphabetic cipher. What this means is that throughout the code, one letter is always used to replace another. For example, using a monoalphabetic cipher, you might always have the letter A being replaced with D. It is important to note that a cipher does not need to follow alphabetic order. Polyalphabetic cipher is another method that provides additional levels of secrecy with messaging. This means that there is more than one cipher alphabet being used so that the same letter is not being replaced by the same other letter each time it comes up. As there is less of a pattern for substituting but being followed, this promotes a much more secure way to encode a message. Oh, okay, I see. So for our title, we use the monoalphabetic cipher. If it's that easy to do, why do we need multiple methods? You see, each of those two methods has its pros and cons. Monoalphabetic ciphers, though easier to decipher or break, are often much easier to write and were easier to provide a key for the receiver to decode the message. Polyalphabetic ciphers, however, are much more difficult to create and communicate effectively with, as the key and the cipher being used are much more complex. The slowness of writing the encrypted messages, mixed with the increased possibility that the message was not deciphered properly, led to hesitancy towards using polyalphabetic ciphers. They were more popular for military use as the need for security was often heightened. That's tremendous information. Thank you, Edwin, for joining us today. We're now going to explore how cryptography has been utilized throughout history by looking into some popular examples. With us for this section of our program 
is noted historian Patrick Cartier. Thanks for being here. It's my pleasure. As you know, I've just finished a tour around the world exploring uses of cryptography in different regions and through different time periods. I'm excited to share with you some of my findings. Well, let's start with some of the basics. What might be some ciphers that people are familiar with? The most common form of cryptography is the basic substitution cipher, where one letter is swapped out for another. This is known as the Caesar cipher, named after Julius Caesar, who would famously encrypt all of his messages by replacing the letters with one three down from it. Though the original cipher used by Julius Caesar was designed to shift the alphabet by three letters, the name is now used to describe any cipher that shifts its text a fixed number from the original alphabet. It is, in fact, one of the early forms of the monoalphabetic cipher. Interesting. Who knew that Caesar would be famous for something other than a salad? What about polyalphabetic ciphers? Are there any prominent examples with that? I'm glad you asked. The Caesar cipher remained popular for quite some time, but eventually it became quite easy to break. The next prominent cipher technique to gain popularity was the Virginia Square. This technique involved making use of the 26 possible letter orders from the Caesar cipher but organizing them into a square. A code word would then be selected, and that would be used to determine what letter was going to be used to replace the actual text. The code word letter would match up with the corresponding letter in the Visioneer Square. This form of encryption was extremely secure for its time period, and despite the fact that it was well known, it remained unbroken for centuries. Wow, that's great. Who knew there were so many famous examples? Can you share with us some current examples, though? Of course I can. The most famous example of cryptography and encryption during the 20th century is most likely the Enigma machine, which was used by the German military during World War II. This machine had such a high number of possible configurations that it was thought to be unbreakable. The beauty of the Enigma machine was that each time a letter was typed, the rotors inside the machine would change so that the letter could be replaced by a brand new cipher. As an additional layer of security, the Enigma machine used by the German military also incorporated a plug board that acted as a basic substitution cipher. The only way to determine what the correct setting was for the machine in order to decipher the code was to have access to the original starting combination of rotors and plug boards. For the Germans, this was kept in a paper copy note that was changed out monthly. The downfall of the Enigma machine as an encryption tool for the Germans was that it did not allow for a letter to be replaced by itself. This seemingly minor flaw allowed the code of the Enigma to eventually be cracked. Wow, what exciting uses of cryptography. It's clearly had a big impact on the world's history. Let's give a big thank you to Patrick for taking time out of his busy schedule to appear on our show. Now, for our final segment for this episode, we'll address the impact that cryptography has had on education. This may not seem obvious at first, as we have been looking at various ways that cryptography was used to keep messages secret, and we usually wouldn't think that in education we are trying to prevent messages from being understood. So to help us better understand this connection, we have world-renowned expert on patterns, Desmond Argyle. Thank you for joining us. So this connection doesn't really seem obvious, but maybe you can enlighten us on how cryptography and education are linked. Thanks for having me on the show, by the way. Nice glasses. Let's get right into it then. So one of the most important aspects of cryptography is decoding a message. When messages are trying to be kept secret, there's obviously someone that isn't supposed to understand what is being said. The process of trying to solve what is being said in a message is called deciphering. One of the original ways that encrypted messages were attempted to be deciphered was through a process called frequency analysis. Frequency analysis tries to take advantage of the fact that certain languages will use some letters more than others. E, for example, in English. People can use the fact to try and look for patterns in the encrypted text that they are presented with. If we use English as our encrypted language, one could try and look for single letter words or short words that are often repeated. There's a good chance that the single letters are either A or I, and the short words could quite often be the. Once the pattern that was used to encrypt those words is identified, the rest becomes much easier. Ah, yes, patterns. Such an integral part of education. You're right. The need to search out patterns among the various observations we make on a regular basis helps humans bring order to an otherwise chaotic world. In an educational setting, 
students are able to feel more confident and in control when they can understand patterns. Even at a young age, children can benefit from learning patterns as they are then able to determine sequences and can make accurate predictions of future events. Recognizing patterns can be a key to learning new concepts. When students recognize a particular pattern, then they can begin to investigate what caused the pattern and then learn from their investigation. The number of different subjects that patterns can play a role in is quite amazing. Typically we think of mathematics when we consider patterns, but in fact, they're also prominent in languages, science, even music. Patterns are such a significant component of the world around us that it is hard to get through a normal day without noticing any patterns or benefiting from them. It's interesting how cryptography can actually help us improve our ability to recognize and understand patterns. Thank you for this. It's been truly an informative chat. Well, thank you for having me on the show. Well, everyone, that's it for our show tonight. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you're now better informed on the history behind some of the techniques that are helping to keep your information safe. See you next time. I'm Kenny Jameson. This was another episode of What Is He Talking About?